Welcome to Malcolm Reed's How to Barbecue Right, a podcast where we talk about barbecue, share recipes, and discuss all things delicious. And now, here's your host, Malcolm and Rochelle Reed. Hey, welcome back to the How to Barbecue Right podcast. I'm your host, Malcolm Reed. And as always, I'm joined by my lovely, talented wife, Miss Southern Shell. We got Tyler over running the board for us. How's everybody doing today? Great. Malcolm, Good. I have a question for you. What is that, Shell? What's a sh- schwank grill? Well, let me tell you. Schwank Grills is a portable 1,500-degree cooking machine. It uses infrared heat, which is perfect for cooking steaks to perfection in as little as three minutes. So you can take a raw steak to fully cooked in three minutes on one of these dudes. The Schwank Grill cooks just like those fancy 1,500-degree broiler-type grills that are seen in fancy steakhouses like the Denver Palm, Morton's, even Roos Chris uses these type grills. And that's how they that's how they make their millions, Shell. And there is a link in the description with a coupon code to receive $150 off Schwank Grills. The code is how to BBQ right. And you can go to Schwank. That's S C H Wank. Dot com. Dot com. Grills dot com and check them out. So y'all go check out the Schwank Grills. They're a proud sponsor of the How to Barbecue Right podcast. Um last weekend you cooked a wild game contest. Well We did. Uh your team, we, my team your group, did. You and a group. What were we called? Players. All about the bucks, because it That's was a, a wild game cooking contest, and I we like partnered. That. So it was Buck Junkies and the Mississippi Land Bank. We made one team. Well, actually, I think the Land Bank guys had been, were doing it last year because last year was the first time they had that event in Centotopia, and it was a pretty cool event. And you know, they asked us this year if we wanted to join them, and we said, "Yeah, we'll you know we'll come out there and." Cook some wild game up for you guys. It was a great event. Oh, the, man. I like the little contest. A little windy. Oh, yeah. The but weather didn't cooperate. If you were in, no, it did. It wasn't bad. You just you needed a you needed a light jacket. I was windburnt. My face was yeah. windburnt the next day. I, we stayed out in the sun. It was pretty nice all day. But we cooked up all kinds of stuff, Shell. Um, Mark took first place with his big, the big, big game, game category, which he cooked white-tailed deer, right? Yeah, it was a, it was a backstrap off a of deer that. We had shot actually down on, on our hunting land. Really? Yep. It was. Did you get a bite? It was yes. delicious. Oh, it melted your mouth. It melted your. He mouth. won that on texture, because and, you know that's the tricky. Part. I mean, as long as you don't over, as long as you don't overcook game, it's it's absolutely delicious. But to get the texture just right, you got to cook it perfect, and it was oh, it was money. It was like meat butter. Yeah. That's what you said. You said it tastes like butter. <laughs> I was like, oh, that's good. Funny, Mark. He probably cooked it from Kerry. Do you think so? Just taking a bite of that as from you know somebody that doesn't eat much wild game. Do you think they would think that was like no, you would be able to tell it was deer meat? No. They wouldn't believe you. I had we had several people argue over me the elk that I cooked. So the elk you got from wild game keepers, wild game butchery, wild yeah. game butchery, mossy oaks, wild game butchery. Yeah, and I'd had some. I've done some stuff with them in the past, and that's why I had some in the freezer. I had some elk medallions. I had some some elk chops, which is like a little porterhouse off an elk. It's got the back strap and some of the tenderloin in it. Um, I had some elk uh, sausages. I had, man, I had all kinds of stuff. I had some wild boar. You had some bacon, pheasant sausage. I had some pheasant sausage. That was good. Did you try it? I had a pheasant bratwurst that I cooked. Uh, no, I did not try the pheasant bratwurst. I tried the elk. So, okay, is elk always that good? <laughs> yeah, elk, elk just, is man. Yeah. It's one of the best cuts of you know types of venison you can cook. I've always. Uh, when I've tried elk, I was like, oh, man, this is so good. It's better than whitetail. You know, oh, it's yeah. better than the deer we have around here. It's just a different – it's in a different ballpark. But and it, it's not very marbled. That and Axis deer, that's the two best. Like, they are creme de la creme when it comes to eating venison. Axis and, and, and elk meat, they are just absolutely delicious. But they, they're they so tasty. Yeah, uh, it, I'm telling you, it's, it's just – when it's cooked right. Now, if you cook it over, all none of it's good to me. There's no in between on deer meat or venison meat. It's either got to be that rare to medium rare or braised. Like all, you cook yeah, it all, all the way, way or it falls apart. So it's there's no rare. there's no in between. Like if you like your stuff on the medium or the well medium well side, don't don't eat don't eat venison. Um, Go with something else. Go with the burger. <laughs> why why were people arguing with you over the elk? Because they because they said it was uh, beef. They thought it was filet mignon. Beef filet mignon. They said, there's no way this is elk. It cannot taste like that. And you know what? So I had all that stuff. It was froze. I put it in a cooler and, and let it kind of slow thaw out. And then when we got there that morning, I got Michael. He was with us, our son. 
And I said, son, will you just season all this meat up? Here's some different seasons. Put whatever yeah, you want on it. But he did them like he was cooking a steak contest. You know, he did all the, you know, he like dry brined it a little bit with some AP and then hit it with some hot rub and then put a little prime beef on it. And I pretty much grilled it all. We let it kind of sit there, and you know, on the cooler and just hang out until I got ready to cook it. And we were cooking that just to give away. I mean, it was a wild game thing. And I said, I, I, I love cooking wild game. I'll just cook some samples and let people try it. And there was not a piece of sausage left. <laughs> yeah. It was that much stuff. Cause you know, everybody kind of brought something and we just had it thrown out. And I was like, well, just fire up a grill, man. I'll go to cooking. And I don't know how many pounds of like wild boar bacon I cooked. So how did you cook that wild boar bacon? So it, it came in like, it had to be three or four pound slabs. That's why you get it when you order it from wild game butcher. When and, I saw it, I was like, is this a ham? Yeah. Cause it kind of looked like a carving <laughs> yeah. ham. That's what it looked like. It had already been smoked. It was fully cooked and you could cook it just like you could slice it up and cook it like bacon and skillet. But what I did, I, it was, I didn't really candy bacon it. Uh, I kind of seasoned it with a little sweet rub, like the barbecue rub on both sides. And I put it on a rack and I threw it over. We had the outlaw smoker going. And I put it over, I put some of it up on top shelf so it'd get extra crispy. And then some of it, it, I had so much, I was just running it on a regular rack. And it, it cooked fantastic. I mean, it would get, it never gets like super crunchy like you think bacon does and, you know, in the skillet or in the oven. I think you, if you fried it, I bet it Oh, would. yeah. If you fried it, it would. It yeah. would. But I kind of had it to where it was, it was the texture of bacon candy. Yeah. But people was like, man, this, they thought it was like country ham or something like that. It reminded me more of country ham because the wild board just doesn't have the fat content as a, domestically raised hog does but it was it's really tasty and it was good yeah it was really good i'm not even that big a fan of wild boar what was your best bite of the day what would you have to say uh mark cooked a speck speckled belly goose breast yeah and it was really good in that deer his yeah. deer i tell you what jamie did and this amazed me it was a quail quesadilla with also used some wild boar chorizo that i had and so he fried up the chorizo on like a, a little blackstone, the little travel blackstone, the 17 incher. And then the quail, it was bacon wrapped quail breast. And he cooked, he smoked those until they were done and then took them off and then unwrapped the bacon off and then sliced the pieces of quail breast into little strips. And he mixed it with the um, chorizo and then took a tortilla, blue plate mayonnaise. Now, this is the secret. This is the secret right here. <laughs> Blue plate mayonnaise with the little uh, silicone brush and spread that on the outside of the case of, of the tortilla shell. Hit it with just a sprinkle of grande Mexican season. So you use grande gringo and you cook one side and it starts browning up like a grilled cheese and you flip it over, load it with the quail, the chorizo, and as much wow. cheese as you think you could put in it and then fold it and it makes a quesadilla and you cook it like a grilled cheese. So think of a. So he grills the inside of his shell too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's smart. Really. So yeah. you get that flavor and it, and it, it really makes it crispy because the time all that cheese and, you know, chorizo has a little grease to it and the quail meat in there. And it was, and he, he served it with a, a cheese dip, a queso. Mm -hmm. It's like a white queso, put a little pico in there and big spoons of that chorizo like just in the middle of it, because if you put all that chorizo in, like it mix it up, it just kind of turns it a pinkish, but doesn't look real good. But if you just float that chorizo over the middle of it, when you dip that quesadilla in it, that was your dipping sauce. And I think he did use like a verde sauce or some kind of green tomatilla sauce or something like that too. I did take kind a bite of, of that quesadilla. It. it was really good. That was, that might be the best bite I had of all really? this. I mean, we had some good stuff. Yeah. And um, we had crawfish potatoes and. Mikey did those. He took little. Like Yukon Gold, baby Yukon Gold potatoes and baked them and then cut them in half and hollowed it out, kind of like a potato skin. Mm -hmm. And then he makes Did he this, show up with that prepped? Um, I think he'd already cooked the potatoes. Yeah. I don't know if he, I, I don't think he baked the potatoes out there, but everything else he made out there. Yeah. Cause uh, that would just seem like yeah. a really easy step to do at home. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And then his, like, he does a crawfish bread. If you've ever had shrimp bread or crawfish, it's a Louisiana thing where it's basically like a lot of, cheese and then crawfish meat and it's got the trinity in it and you just put it on top of bread and bake it and it gets all just delicious well he's like that'll be good in a potato so it's like a it little was. loaded bite of potato and it was man those were good he also did um it was, it was a take cake. on it was a take on shrimp and crab cakes so he took he like many many crab cakes and but what was the meat in it? But what it wasn't crab? crab. It was Mississippi farm raised catfish. Or I don't know uh, if he I don't know if he's actually something he caught or 
I don't know where he got the catfish. It was, it was a, <laughs> you know, I'm, he may have got it from Randy, his brother. He might have caught it out of Bridgetown Lake. But it was, uh, so he took that catfish and blackened the fillets on the on the flat top and then shredded that meat up to where it's kind of like crab, you know, yeah. it kind of flakes Flaked. and it gets flaky like crab meat. Then he made these little hand cakes with it. And then he put those, like took a shrimp and kind of folded, uh, split it a little bit and then wrapped the tail around it to where it was stuffed. And then he cooked those on the outlaw. And they were really good too. It was a good bite. I like I like the, the catfish cake by itself. Yeah, I did with a too. Little, if you had a little remoulade to go with that, man. Um, Mark also did a cheesecake and it won it, first place. It won first place with it was a cheesecake. It really good. What was it, a caramel cheesecake? Yeah, with some of that little glass his wife makes, Emily makes. Like caramel glass. Um, you did watermelon margaritas. Yeah, they didn't do. People didn't like them too much. I mean, I think I was like fourth or fifth. I, they weren't sweet enough. There wasn't. None, there wasn't a drop left. That was the one drink I made a jug of it. Plus, what I have a pitcher of it to turn in. I mean, for me personally, they were delicious. Yeah, you don't think for, they were sweet enough? For the I should have added more simple yeah. sh- simple syrup. I did. So what I did is we. I took. I made a simple syrup and I let it cool, and I bought. All the watermelon I could find at Kroger. It, it's not watermelon season. It's hard to find good watermelon. <laughs> I had to buy the one that comes with like cantaloupe and honeydew. It's like the. And mix. I separated it out and got all the chunks of the watermelon. And then when that simple syrup uh, cooled down a little, I pureed all that watermelon and then uh, put it in the simple syrup and just let it sit like I would a pitcher of tea and let it just kind of infuse this, the simple syrup. And so I had a watermelon simple syrup, Did and then strain I strained it? it through a wire mesh strainer, and it was really good. I mean, I guess it could have been sweeter. But I, I use that. You know I how use... these contests are. You need it to be like super sweet or super yeah. salty. Or I should have went by the dip and got some of their watermelon snow cone syrup and used that too. I did add some watermelon pucker. I mean, I mean, I had like, but where I messed up was I should have just went two bottles of tequila. I went three bottles <laughs> of Patron in it, <laughs> and then like a bottle and a half of Grand Marnier. You couldn't tell. No, and then lime juice. It's it's really easy. It's really a good recipe though. And then y'all took it, and when you made it, you muddled some mint, and put that in there and shook it up real good with ice, and then strained it out into the glasses, and that's how we turned it in with a little cube of it was good watermelon and a lime wheel. You also did a Bloody Mary. Bloody what Mary's. You, what's your Bloody almost Mary recipe? One. I make like a Chicago Bloody Mary, so it's got a little of everything in it. Okay. I start. What does the Chicago Bloody Mary mean? Just got a little bit. It's of got everything. a lot of it. Yeah, it's it's not just tomato juice and vodka. You know, I start with a good healthy two shots of Tito's, and then cracked black pepper, pinch of pinch of cayenne, dashes of Worcestershire, a little half teaspoon of of horseradish, some olive brine, some pickle juice, some squeeze some squeeze of of lime in it to give it, and some squeeze of lemon too, like a wedge of each. And then I take um, whatever kind of Bloody Mary mix you want. This was that Morning Wood. That and one's I, my favorite. But see, they have a spicy deal and they have an original. That's the two I bought. And I did 50 50. So you still got some of that flavor. Do, which mixed, one do you like the best? I like the mix. <laughs> and then the original is okay. Yeah. It's good. And the spicy deal can get a little hot on you. So it tones that down. But I love that dill pickle flavor in a Bloody Me Mary. Too. I think it just makes it. So you take that and you shake it all up and you strain it because it gets some of the grit out of it because I, I knew they would judge you like it had too much seasoning and stuff in it. Yeah. And, oh, I, oh, I hit it with a little of Mark and Jamie's prime beef too because that gives it a little umami flavor, that little Prime beef something. is a perfect Bloody Mary sandwich. Oh, yeah. We rim the glass with it. That's what yeah. that's the secret rimming the glass with too. And it's good. And then we made skewers. So I took um, meat. Everybody knows what a meat stick is, right? It's like a little meat stick you buy. It's like a little, so um, like that's, a Slim Jim, but it's I didn't buy the Slim Jim. I spent a little money on a decent meat <laughs> stick. So this is something we figured out when we started going to Minnesota. Yeah, they would use meat sticks instead of bacon. bacon. Yeah, and the bacon every time we cook bacon, no matter how crispy we get it, once you stick it in that Bloody Mary, it sogs it out. It sogs it out. It gets yep. all mushy, and it's not a bacon you want to eat. So we took the little, I took a little, made a little celery stick and left, left a little of the greenery on it. I made a, hung a shrimp up. We used a, a, a peeling it like a cocktail shrimp, pretty good size one. Made skewers with some cheese and I smoked some, I did some smoked sausage cut up and it had an olive and then, uh, what else was on there? Pepperoni pepper. We just, we garnished it up. I mean, yeah. it looked really good. It's cute. Good, good little Bloody Marys. They almost won. 
You know what got what beat us? The booth set up. We didn't go all out decorating. We should have. We should have decorated a little more. I didn't know that was included in I your. I didn't know they were going to factor total. in. Yeah, if they hadn't have factored in the booth set up, we'd have beat everybody by sixty, seventy points. That maybe that's why they figured it up like that. <laughs> Can't let these guys come in here and win. We won two first place though. Yeah, third, I, would, I think it was third overall. Day. We had a great day. Um, this morning you said. I sure would like some chicken quarters. Yeah, I saw someone post. I don't remember who it was in the community. They posted they were cooking chicken quarters, and it got me to craving them. When's the last time you've had a good chicken quarter? It's been a minute. I've yeah, I made up a little chicken rub. It was kind of like kicking chicken chicken quarters, and those things, man. When you you can you can brine them a little bit to get some flavor in them, and then dry the skin out and oil it a little bit and season them up, and put them on a grill and just I like cooking them hot, to like four hundred degrees, until they just get crispy almost mm-hmm. on the outside oh, man they're good i like them because they're so juicy and flavorful yep. that dark meat man there's something about it so much better the than eyes are meat. like that like boneless skinless thighs i love cooking those things to me the chicken quarters is the best part of the chicken yeah. well wings wings is the best yeah. yeah you can keep those breasts they're just dry yeah they don't have no flavor they ain't got no flavor they wish they was as good as that, <laughs> that dark meat that's like chicken plate meat yeah you get a chicken quarter Heck yeah. Like old school firemen selling chicken mm-hmm. plates. But I was wondering, I was like, what? I, I wrote that on my notes. What got Malcolm thinking about chicken quarters this morning? <laughs> I was flipping through the <laughs> flipping through the community, checking out what folks are doing. My uh, buddy Dalton's been posted. Dayton's been posted a bunch in there, man. He, he had a burger question. So let me ask you. I don't know. Did you see that? Yeah, I did. Do you take your burgers uh, pink on the inside or absolutely no pink? I mean, where am I getting them from? Are you cooking? That it? was that was what I said. It depends. If it's a so we're talking Hueys. Yeah, yeah. Hueys, so you go to Hueys. The, Hueys is our Memphis like best burger place. Mm-hmm. It's a local chain. Is it the absolute best? No, that's arguable. But is it the? It's the standard, the gold standard. You you can cook a burger as good as Hueys. You got a pretty good burger. I will order my burger medium there. Cause you know what they get they they get that meat ground and it comes from Charlie's Meat Market or it used to I guess it still does I think it still does and so you know you kind of know that they're using good quality it's certified Angus beef brand too so it's they've always used the you know they got the sign up in there that's kind of beef they use so you know it's good quality stuff and I will I'm agree I will order mine a little on the pink side if I know where that meat's coming from if I if I'm grinding the meat myself making my own ground beef. Or when we grind up deer and, and we make them, oh, medium all day long. I want it medium. I'm not a medium rare burger guy. I'm a medium. But and it, So I like seeing some pink. I don't want it red. I do too. But if it's like a burger patty that I've just picked up at the grocery <laughs> store, oh, no, I'm cooking that all the way. I want it all the way. Even like I don't even know if I'd cook 80-20 beef from the grocery store, like if it's just in the package and I didn't know where the grind came from. Or it's the chub. I'm not. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going pink. I'm not. I'm not risking that. I don't want any E. coli. But if I if I grind it myself, I'm I'm perfectly fine with eating it a little pink. I like them a little pink inside. They're juicier. They're more yeah. flavorful. See, I got a way to get around. Like, and that's that's one reason why we started doing it. Adding, like, if you go buy a couple pounds of ground beef from Kroger, or Walmart, or somewhere in the package. Bring it home. You know you got to cook it done because you you don't know how that <laughs> that meat was treated before it was ground. Add you a big old dollop of blue plate per pound, like a heaping tablespoon per pound of meat, and work that in. And you ain't got to worry about dry burger. You can cook it to well done, and it's still juicy as it could be. That that mayonnaise makes all the difference. What? Why do they say um, don't overwork your your meat? Because it gets your packy. Like you know the difference. The kind of the much? texture. I mean, I try to. Now I got me a little burger press. I think it works better because I'll just make a ball and put it in the burger press and lightly and you know press it down and it forms the patty. But what you're talking about is like seasoning it up and then working it in your hands, yeah, kind of like patting it all. Over. Yeah, like you do meatloaf, and it's that's the texture you get. You know how that texture it's more packy. Yeah, and it change it toughens the meat up some working it. I like my burger just to barely be holding together. You know, because where it, you don't want it crumbling apart where you can't flip it or anything, but you want it. You want it to work it as least as possible, do you so add, the texture is better in the meat. Do you ever put seasonings, or is it just the mayonnaise? Uh, most of the time, I don't season it prior. I, I I just don't. I usually leave my seasoning on the outside of the burger. But I mean, I guess you could eat it with a little something if you wanted to. 
any onions or no, cheese or no, anything? No, I'm in not there? making mama burger. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what Eddie Murphy said. Make a mama burger. You got peppers? McDonald's ain't got no peppers. Green onions. That's basically meatloaf on a bun. You're making a meatloaf, yeah, on on flight bread. What do you think, Tyler? Are you a pink in your burger kind of guy? Yeah, I'm more like medium well. So like, if there's a little bit of pink in there, I'm good. Like, I all of my wife's burgers, I'm taking up to well done, regardless, no matter what, no matter where if I know where it's coming from. But if it's like those frozen, like cheap patties you buy, Bubba burgers, like Bubba yeah. burgers, or like Bubba burgers, like but then burgers. they also just have like the eighty twenty, but are, they're frozen or whatever yeah. in the freezer section. All of that's got to come up to well done. Yeah, like I agree. I'm not not down for that, but I'm cooking that to one forty five. One forty five. Yeah. That's what you to can me, do. That's well, well done. done. Yeah. <laughs> What's well done USDA to you? You're going to one sixty five. That's a little too far. Yeah. One forty five. One forty five. As long as there's no pink in the middle, then yeah. I think you're good. But if I'm going to Huey's, I'm going Midwell. That's where I, that's where I'm at. Midwell. Yeah, I, f- I feel like you still get some of the juice, but it's not like it's not completely dried out to a crisp, and there's a little bit of mm-hmm. pink in the center. So if I'm if I'm going most of the time, if I'm doing a burger like like well done, like I know I want, it, I'm doing smash burger. Yeah. That way, yeah. it's flattened out. You're getting all the crispiness to it, and it ain't gonna be dry because you have so much cheese on it. <laughs> But that's if I'm a, that's if I know a, yeah. you get the texture, greasy deliciousness. Yeah, there, of yeah. doing that. But like, just to, if I'm grilling it, I really want to know where that beef comes from. I just like to get a good ground chuck. Whenever I have those frozen patties, a lot of times, especially if we're feeding people, like a lot of people, I'll throw them on the smoker, like the pellet grill. Oh, it's too easy. Oh, it's so good. The only thing you better clean that grill after you do, <laughs> before you do it and after you do it, because you are fixing to make some drippings. Could you like? Catch them, put like a put you them on the top it. rack and put a pan in. Yeah, so you could even cook it on like a raised rack over yeah. a sheet pan with with full. That'd be a better way to do it to keep your grill from getting too nasty. But yeah, that'll that's a surefire way. Whenever people tell me their pellet grill caught on fire, it's usually because they cooked burgers on it, uh, or pork, butt. and then and didn't clean it and cooked a pork butt, or they cooked a, like an overnight pork butt. And then they cranked it up to do burgers. And it's, <laughs> it's that and combination. It's, yeah, some it's way. some combination. Because you think about it, you, a pellet grill, most of them have some kind of heat diverter, but it doesn't cover the whole bottom of the grill. It leaves gaps to oh, where yeah. the heat and the smoke and everything can get up. But when they load it up with burgers, they put it out on every square inch of the cooking grate, and it might be over the drip area. It might be closer to the fire. It might you know, be to where it can drip. It ain't even hitting the diverter. And that's what getting down in there and getting to that fire is what causes it. And that's what that's why you get those uh, burns, those uh, big fi- flames. It happens. It happens. <laughs> Shell's done it. Oh, try it with a wagyu burger. You better you better be catching the grease <laughs> some kind of way, man. Those things make so much uh, grease that it ain't funny. You uh, burn your house down. <laughs> that's what uh, Cheyenne was saying. They had to. Uh, their pellet grill caught on fire. They had to pull it out from underneath the porch. You, yeah, you better. She was worried their house was fixed to catch on fire. Now, whatever you do, just get it unplugged and get it out away from the house and don't open the lid. Just let it let it do its thing and hope it don't burn back. If it burns back, there ain't, you ain't got much option. You need to dump the pellets quick. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. You don't want it to burn back in there because I've, I've had a, I've caught a Yoder on fire like that. <laughs> it burned back on me and got up in the in the hopper and I still had it loaded and I didn't have a way to dump them. I just got me old plastic. Lenny's cup and went scooping, you know. While it was on fire? That, the pellets weren't. They were smoking out of the hopper, but I guess okay. it was in the tube burning back. And I knew that if it ever caught to it and it still had enough air going, that was fixing to be an inferno. So I went to getting pellets out quick as I could. Then I had to clean the whole thing and let it run. I mean, it, it's, it's okay. It just happened, you know. Pellets backed up on me. Well, Easter's this weekend. It is. It's a big mayonnaise holiday, wouldn't you say? <laughs> <laughs> People make a lot of lot of creamy salads on Easter. Thank deviled you. eggs. You can't make deviled eggs without mayonnaise. I bet I go through a couple jars yeah. on a yeah. big holiday weekend. <laughs> that Thanksgiving, that's your main ones for using mayonnaise, I'd say. But I always use blue plate. Always. Choose the best. Real mayonnaise quality since 1927. Hashtag spread the love. But what so what else what when you think of Easter, what are you thinking of? Ham? So smoked ham is the obvious. Gotta have it. Yeah. It's like the easiest thing to cook, yeah. would you say? Oh, yeah. That and bologna. <laughs> Those are the two. <laughs> like, you can't mess up a ham or a, or a chub of bologna. You think it's because they're already fully cooked? You could really just eat them cold if you wanted to? Yeah. 
There's nothing really. There's nothing you're just it. warming it up on a smoker, basically. Have you ever seen anybody screw up a ham? I've like, seen some people screw up some bologna. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie Williams. <laughs> no, it he wasn't his fault. About it. We put bologna on the grill one time at Memphis and May, and we must have cooked it for 12 hours. <laughs> By the time we went back to the grill, I said, somebody said, this grill's still on. And I said, oh, man. That was the baloney, and it was it was dark, man. It was it's dry. Charcoal. You could, oh yeah, we turned we turned baloney into charcoal. It might have had like you talk about pink in the middle. It might have had one, you know, <laughs> like tube right through the middle that was still looked like baloney. The rest of it was black as it could be, like coal. Did y'all cut it open and see? Oh yeah, I had to cut it and see what it was like. It was nothing you could salvage on it. I was gonna glaze it and everything. And I just smooth forgot about the baloney on the grill. Well, uh, so it can you can ruin it. That made it. That's when we started making uh, schedules. Yeah, <laughs> baloney comes off, goes on. Comes baloney on. comes off. Set alarm. It's easy to get distracted. It's so easy to get distracted out there at Memphis May. There's a lot going on. You're setting up. You're doing this. Mm-hmm. You're talking to people. You're having some drinks. Bullfrog. I gotta give a shout out to my new friends at Sinkfields. They were cooking with the waste protein, and they came over and said they've been watching videos of ours for a long time and stuff. But they, he was cooking some bison ribeyes. And he brought me some to try to turn in. They were fantastic. But he brought me two of those bison ribeyes. He said he got them from somewhere. I think it was Minnesota or somewhere. But they were fantastic. They were really good. So shout out to Sinkfields. So would you cook bison ribeyes for Easter? That really wouldn't be an Easter thing, would it? You did Easter brisket. Yeah. and I see, But see, I, I think about brisket on Easter. I think that's something that a lot of people cook brisket. Um, you know, it's probably a lot of an oven cook, but yeah. you know, us, us, us people that like to fire up smoke, there's, there's, there's a lot of brisket for Easter. I mean, brisket does kind of make sense. You I've, can use a gravy, serve it with mashed yeah. potatoes. I was going to say, I got an Easter brisket recipe. It's not like your traditional smoked brisket. It's just done on a smoker, but I did it like gravy, gravy style brisket Yeah, with the vegetables. You put a little uh, good wine way. and tomato puree mm-hmm. in the wrap. Fancy it up a little bit. It was really good. kind of like cooking like really good short ribs, but you just do it on a brisket. So um, Mark on the community asked <clears throat> a question. Okay. He's toying with the idea of injecting the ham, his ham, with the sweet barbecue sauce. Um, he's basically just putting a glaze on the inside. Yeah. Would you do it? I probably wouldn't. But just simply because that meat's already been fully cooked, and if you know the texture of ham, when they cure it, it's really tight texture. It's not so really going to spread. Yeah, I don't know if it's going to spread really well when you put it in there. I think what you're going to end up doing is having, if you can get some of it to stay in the ham, it's just going to be pockets of an injection. It's not going to do, I don't think it's going to do what you think. Once that, that texture, that meat's been changed so much from the curing process and smoking process, it's not going to take the injection absorb. the way you want it to. You're better off using that glaze on the outside or or when you slice it up, brush the slices. You know, If you want to get that flavor in there, you could do that. As you sliced it, but I probably wouldn't try to inject it like that. Could be wrong. Let me know how it turns out. But I've never tried it. But that's just that's a good observation. Point. I don't think it would take it. It's a completely different texture. <clears throat> it's not like a yeah. raw meat. Texture. Yeah, it's not a raw meat texture. Like if you had a green ham, you could inject it and smoke it. Now you're still. It's going to be more like pork roast or you know, if pulled you take pork. it far enough, pulled pork. But I have seen people take green hams and smoke them and then slice them. Uh, for the holidays, I remember some. It's hard to find just a green ham that had, a ham that hadn't been cured or smoked or anything. Just yeah, the the rear leg quarter off a hog. I still remember someone emailed in and asked a question. This has been years ago. They said they were gonna cook a, a whole hog, and they were thinking they were gonna have this much ham for slicing and this much bacon for this. Like they were yeah. thinking it was gonna come turn off out just that like ham. Yeah. Or come off that hog as you know these as yeah. these cured pieces. Yeah. We're gonna have this much sausage. We're gonna use it for <laughs> breakfast. I'm like, it ain't gonna work like that. Yeah. Work like yeah. that. Doesn't work like that. It's pretty much just all pulled meat when Every you get it off of it. the yeah when it's hog. cooked right. Um, now we, you could chop it, and you probably could slice some of it if you didn't you know took certain areas you know to not a highest temperature. But it's a, it's gonna be more like a roasted pork if you do that. Part of me wonders if that was a joke question. Like, they're just screwing up. I don't think so. I just think, you know, some people have never done it. Probably don't know. Yeah. There's no bad, no, I don't, I've always said there's no bad or dumb questions if you don't know. Um, we've also done smoked crab legs for Easter before. Yeah. That's something different that uh, that's really good, man. I like it. 
Like I love me some steamed crab legs. I love me some boiled crab legs, but those grilled ones, and what makes them so good is you're just constantly basting them with the little but garlicky, herby butter mixture with a little lemon juice in it. And then the, those, the pores on that crab shell just kind of absorb it. And you think, oh, it's not going to get in the meat. No, it picks up flavors from the grill, from the smoke. It does. It picks up the butter and the seasoning that's from it. And it's just, and what I like about doing it on, a, especially a pellet grill, is that pellet grill is moving so much air that the outside shell is getting kind of brittle. So it makes cracking them and getting to the meat really, really easy. And you can do it in like 30 minutes. It doesn't take long on the grill because those crab legs are fully cooked when you get them. They're fully, they free, they take them off the boat. I guess they throw them in some hot water right there. and They shock freeze them. And so they're cooked. You just got to warm them back up. And that's why you can steam them or just drop them in some boiling water. You don't really have to boil them. You're just reheating them in that water. Does it mess with your smoker at all? Like, no, I, you know, I always thought that, and I would say, oh, I don't want to put any kind of nasty or, you know, fishy Fish smelling yeah. something that's going to leave some kind of residue because it's going to mess up the seasoning on my pit. I've never, never noticed that the doing crab legs on it has done anything to an off flavor or anything to the grill after I've been done. Never. So, so I, you, I'm not scared to do it. You just throw them on their froze. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times, yeah. If I don't, sometimes I, don't, I just go buy them and put them right on out of the box. And just have their butter melted and ready, and it'll kind of coagulate up because they're cold. But as they thaw out, they're releasing a lot of that moisture from being froze, and they kind of self base themselves a little bit, and they're steaming because they're getting hot. And it's 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 really a great way to to do crab legs if you've never done them. And I think they get more way more flavor. Yeah, they do get they do get more flavor. I don't know if it's because I'm eating it and you know put using my hands to eat, That's, and I'm getting yeah. all the butteriness off the shell. That probably has something to do with it too, but. Either way, it's, it's it's nothing but goodness. What what do you like better, smoked crab legs, boiled crab legs, steamed crab legs? Probably smoked. I'm really I think not. So. Me too. You don't. I mean, I only get them when I cook them. I don't know anywhere else that does that. You know, what, like a smoke? restaurant wise. Yeah. But most of the times you get them in a restaurant, they're steamed. Now they're big into doing these bull in the bags now. I'm seeing there's a lot of those restaurants popped up, but. The only place, let's see. They're not as good. Hold on. My, what I say, would I take my grilled crab leg over the steamer in Orange Beach? I would probably go to steamer. <laughs> well, that way. I you don't just, know. It's the experience or whatever. That, when I think of like, you tell beer. me, where's the best crab legs you ever had? Man, that steamer in Orange Beach, Alabama is pretty dang good. And you know, those are froze crab legs. They ain't, they're not getting snow crab out of the Gulf like that. No. Those came from Alaska somewhere, you know, Barren Sea. But man, they're good. Because they're big old crab legs. And we've got a place in Horn Lake that that has that sells a crab leg that rivals it. That crawfish haven up there. That's a where I, that's where I buy mine when I'm gonna when I, we're gonna do a crawfish bowl. I always throw some crab legs in there. Or, or if I'm gonna buy some and them? cook for my mom on the grill, I'll buy them there. They sell them in clusters. Do they sell them cooked already? Like I mean, they're, not cooked. I mean, they're fully cooked, froze. I mean, ready to eat. Oh, like hot and ready to eat. Do they ever sell? Yeah, them you can go there and buy like a crab leg dinner. Um. I don't know if they boil them or they steam. I bet they steam them. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've never, I've always done them myself. I don't usually, when I buy from them, I'm buying either raw or live crawfish. They're shrimp. They've got some shrimp that I like too. I never asked where they come from. I'm crab legs and shrimp. Every shrimp. time you do crab legs, you always buy the shrimp too. You have to. Why not? That's a heck of an Easter dinner. It's not Oh, go get you a box of crab legs and get you a bunch of shrimp, throw them in a pan with the butter. You can th- I've started throwing them in froze too. What your shrimp? The shrimp, just a big full size pan. I'll melt me a couple sticks of butter, mix some lemon juice in with it, and some Cajun seasonings, and maybe some fresh parsley, and then mix all that up, and just pour it all over those froze shrimp in the pan, and stick them in the pit. In about ten minutes, those juggers are gonna be thawed out, and you go stir them a little bit. Let them go another ten minutes. Stir them a little bit. Another ten minutes and thirty minutes total. They are perfect, and it's like you get those shrimp, and they're you got the it's great because all the, the pan catches all that butter and everything, and I pour that up, and that's the dipping sauce for eating the shrimp. And it's like, man, you can make yourself sick <laughs> off those buttery shrimp and crab legs. And the best part's dipping dipping a crusty bread in that butter. Yeah, you gotta have the crusty bread. Oh, yeah. I know some people. Uh, Stale cracker was like, I can't believe you cooked shrimp for thirty minutes. Yeah, like, it's not how you think. That's not how you think. Yeah, it's really slow, I guess. I mean, I, really. They're not overcooked. No, not at all. They're perfectly cooked. Yeah. The texture is perfectly cooked. Now, when we boil shrimp, we don't cook them that long. 
they go like they usually go in when we kill the fire. So you know your pot's boiling; it's two hundred twelve degrees. You kill your fire, you throw your shrimp in, and just let them soak a little bit. And you'll notice you'll know a shrimp's done when about four of them start floating to the top. <laughs> That's when it's like, all right, we got to get all this shrimp out, and the the texture of them will just pop, and they're perfectly cooked. When they start, when you see a st- few of them start floating, if you wait till all of them float, they're overcooked. But if you catch them and just a few of them start releasing and going to the top of the water, that's when they're done. Uh, to me, the popping is how I know it's perfectly Texture of a shrimp, cooked. yeah. How would you, so you've had a shrimp where you bite into it and it's leathery, it's Ugh, tough. Mushy. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have a little snap to it. You want it to have all just All the flavor's gone. Oh, yeah. It's like chewed gum or something, <laughs> you know? It's bad texture. Yeah. I'm a texture person on seafood. I, it's got to be just right. You know, and that's what, you can really get some bad seafood. That's the one thing to me. It's probably one of the more challenging things to cook, is to be able to learn to cook fish and seafood right. Uh, that one's always It's a lot harder in pork. Yeah. yeah. It's a lot harder in <laughs> pork You've always beef. struggled. Yeah. It took me a lot of years to figure out how to do it right. There wasn't nobody telling you back then. Um. So we did have a question in the community about smoke crab, but this is about Dungeness. So what's the Dungeness crab? I don't know if I've ever had, like, I've never cooked Dungeness crab. I've cooked blue crab. Let me see. But are Dungeness the big wide ones? I'm the, pulling them up. Uh. Let me see. Yeah, it's a big wide crab. I've seen them. I've never really never really messed with those. But he said he... Um, I think of Joe's Crab Shack when I see yeah, that. Yeah. He's a Dungeness crab. Um, 250 for half an hour, basing every five to ten minutes. But he said the crab was overpowered by the smoke flavor. Really? Might have been too heavy on the smoke. Depends on what kind of smoker it was, too. Like if you throw chunks of wood and stuff. Like if, if I'm cooking crab legs on a grill, like, a say, a Weber or uh, a drum, I'm not adding any smoke. I'm just letting the charcoal do the flavoring because it's going to be plenty. And in a pellet grill, you know, the, it, I usually do it at about 300, 350 degrees, so it's cooking a little hotter. You don't get a ton of smoke at those temperatures. You're, it's it's like an outdoor oven at that point. You get some. It, it does have grilled flavor, but I've never had them to where it was overpowered at all. And you've done them on the old hickory before. Yeah, too. and it doesn't. And I'll use the gas assist on it. Oh, really? And not and or either charcoal and don't put any wood in it, so it's burning clean too. It's all about a clean. It's all about a clean fire because you don't. And see, like seafood is so delicate that it's going to absorb a lot of smoke flavor. So you can't use a whole lot of wood on it, or you're going to get it's going to taste overpowered. It's a real delicate meat, so just you got to think about that. I usually don't try not to over season it. I use a lot of I use a lot of butter, a lot of, a lot of know, butter, a little citrus, a lot of butter, a lot of butter, and that's how it's good. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, shrimp cooked in butter is one of the better things in life. <laughs> like poached butter shrimp. Oh man. And then re dip it in shrimp before you oh, eat yeah. it. Well, Mount, we need to take a quick break. Pay some bills. Let's pay some. The How to Barbecue Right podcast is brought to you by our friends at Primo Grills. Shell, did you know that Primo is the only ceramic grill made right here in the good old USA? What? Are you telling me that Primo Grills are proudly crafted here in the USA, ensuring top-notch quality and support for local craftsmanship? I sure am. Plus, Primo Grill not only delivers mouth-watering flavor, but because of their innovative oval design and superior ceramic construction, Primo Grills also gives you a ton of cooking versatility. Whether you're smoking low and slow or searing a steak to perfection, Primo Grills gives you the consistent heat distribution for mouth-watering results every time. What she said, y'all. Y'all visit primogrill.com and check them out. Also on the community, I saw Ethan had posted. He had a big old pile of wood in front of his smoker. So I started thinking like about sourcing wood and how you source wood and where you find wood. and That's kind of a tricky it can be, Damn. yeah, for sure. I mean, I guess if you're from an area that doesn't have a lot of different. It's good not wood. easy to get it shipped. <clears throat> well, the problem is you can you can find places to order it online, but it's all been kiln drying, and they have to do that so states will let them ship it across state lines because they don't want to risk there being any bugs or anything in it that's going to introduce it to another region and you know maybe cause a problem with the trees or, or anything they have. So they say you got to dry it out and kiln dry. I mean, it's like a big oven. They put the wood in there and they really like hammer it with heat to take the moisture content out of it. I guess it kills anything else. Yeah. I guess the high heat. 
and then they sell it. So this wood that you see like in your academies or your Home Depots or Lowe's or anywhere like that, Walmarts, that's all been kiln drying. What I like to smoke with is local wood. So here in Mississippi, we have really great access to hickory, to wild cherry, to pecan, to oak. Those are the four main species that you'll see me smoking with. Because that's what you have that access to. Because that's what we have access to. It's really great cooking wood. Out in Texas, they got a lot of post oak. They got a lot of pecan. They got the mesquite. So that's why they use that. So wood's kind of regional to me. And a lot of times the barbecue is in those areas because that's what the pitmasters have cooked it with. So it just happens to be hickory's pretty commonly found and oak's really commonly found. So you see that used a lot. But your fruit woods, like your apples and your peaches and your cherries, those make excellent smoking woods for getting flavor. Well, where but, do you find local wood? I mean, I you I mean, if you can find a tree service, a lot of times those guys will sell cooking wood too on the side. That's a good place. Um, you know, some of your stores that sells grills and stuff, they source local wood. There'll be somebody that comes and sells them. Barbecue and we, we, shop. Yeah. We've had a guy here that would come to the shop and. You know, we could buy, he would already bundle it up for, for resale, and it was some stuff that he wouldn't cut. People will have those trees go down in their yards, or, you know, they'll need somebody to remove them. So that they see a good species of tree that they know they could sell for cooking wood. A lot of those guys will put it to the side and stuff and sell it. Um, I mean, in a pinch, I've, I've cooked with those wood chunks that you buy at the store. I've cooked with those splits. Uh, I'm not scared to. You don't, like, the dry wood is great for BTUs. It's great for heat. It doesn't give you as much uh, smoke flavor because the moisture has been cooked out of it. Um, you know, it's been dried out of so it. So you're saying the kiln wood yeah. dried. Yeah, it's been super dried, so you don't get as much smoke from it. It'll go right to fire, right to flame first. It's gonna, it's it's great for running in a stick burner because it gives you a good heat. Um, it, is it, it's not as great for flavoring because you really want a greener wood, which greener just means it has a higher moisture content. It hasn't been seasoned as long. And so, is there a magic number? Uh, you know, I've seen people say like you want wood that's got like 18, 20% moisture content for flavor for your dry wood. They want down to as low as 15%, you know, but I really, I never get caught up in those numbers of it. I just kind of know where my wood comes from and know what I'm doing with it. Um, you know, often when you see us cook, if I'm not running a stick burner. I'm burning on a bed of coal. So that's my main heat. So I don't have to use that really, really dry wood. I'd like to have a little greener wood because I'm just adding enough wood to give me some smoke flavor. And, you know, used to, when we first started cooking, everybody, like, you go to these barbecue contests and everybody would have a five-gallon bucket <laughs> full of wood. Yeah. And it, they put fill it up with water and soak in it, trying to rehydrate it to get it to last longer, get it to smoke more. It doesn't really work like that. Once you've had that wood seasoning, hydrating it back in water is not going to add that much. What it's going to do is going to make it steam more. Um, so you're really not getting any more smoke flavor out of it doing it that way. So. So you just need to know, I mean, if you're serious about it and you really think that you're playing with these wood flavors and you want to get the best, use, you know, go outsource you some local wood and then, you know, know get your little moisture meter and dry it till, and then go to cooking with it. So I bought you a moisture meter for Christmas. I've used yeah. it too. I've used it too. Just to check. I mean, it's not something I, oh, I'm not going to cook with this because it's not <laughs> yeah. moisture or whatever. <laughs> it was just interesting for me to see and, you know, see what it burns like. I mean, like some green wood, so if you went down and cut down a tree and you went to smoking with it, yeah, you could use it. Like I we've I mean, I've I've had some cherry off a tree that was cut down that same week. But it's a lot stronger because it you know, it hasn't had time to lay on the ground, hasn't had time to dry out any. So it has a lot more moisture in it. So it's gonna give you a thicker smoke, it's gonna be a lot stronger flavor, and you will over smoke stuff too. So you just have to take all that into account. Just because when you're cooking, I mean when you're heating it, you're having to cook off the moisture yeah and some of those impurities come with it and mixing your smoke and it can give you some bad flavors and so that's why you you know you want it somewhat seasoned you don't want it completely dry but um i remember when you first started cooking everybody had was soaking wood everybody that's how we it did like it. a thing we would go buy you know sticks of wood or whatever or chunks and we'd put them in a bucket and fill it up with water that was the first thing you did at the contest get your wood soaking <laughs> And then when you added it on, it would go to steaming and sizzling and then make that white stick smoke. And that's you're cooking all that steam off that wood where you had it in the water. I, but nobody does that anymore. No, you don't see I don't even hear people talk about it. Mm. Like, I guess people kind of realize well, nobody, nobody was talking about why they did it. They were just doing it because they saw somebody else do it. Why'd you do it? Because I saw Wayne Booth doing it. <laughs> he sucked all his wood. John Wheeler, they were it. sucking yeah. all their wood. So. They were the why not? top yeah. dogs back then, that's yeah. Right. 
have you ever made your own charcoal? No. Uh, why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess if it was apocalyptic times, uh, you'd, it'd come in handy, but I'm not taking the time to make me 50 pounds of charcoal and it'd take two days to do it. Is you it gotta, what do you do? I think, I mean, most of the guys I've seen do it, they use like these big drums or something like that. And so they'll have a, one drum they fill up with wood. It's kind of on top of another drum they're building the fire in. They get it all burning and get it going, and then they st- snuff it out. And they let it sit there and smolder until everything cooks off, and it cooks down into coals, and what's left is the charcoal. It's a Do process. You use wet wood or dry wood in I, that? I they just throw wood in there. <laughs> it didn't matter. I don't, yeah, I, don't, I don't know what all they're putting in there, but that's how it's a process like that or something. So basically, man, as long as Royal Oak can make it, I'm gonna let them have at it. I'll <laughs> use theirs. Let's see, that's too involved to make your own charcoal. You're not getting a bang for your buck. That's a lot of wood. You'd have yeah, to source those, it. When they make the charcoal, like the charcoal plants, you got to think they've got like these 18-wheeler looking trailers that are their ovens. that They're putting wood in there, and you know, they're putting it in there by the front end loader load and then lighting it on fire and putting it out. So they're making tonnage. Now, you can't do that at home. I mean, you, could, you know, you could probably make 50 pounds at a time or something like that. I'd burn that up and, you know, you could burn that up in a day. Yeah. And you got to make go back two more days and make charcoal <laughs> again. You'd have to get a, a, a procedure, a process going down for it. You know how people will complain like, oh, I found a rock in my bag of charcoal. Is that yeah. just because it's. Yeah, they're scooping up wood with a front end loader and throwing it in. I mean, they try to keep, they try to keep it as clean as they can, I promise you. But it ain't like they go in there and throw a handful of screws <laughs> and bricks and whatever they want <laughs> yeah, in yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. It just happens sometimes. It just happens, yeah. I found all kinds of stuff in charcoal, not just royal oak charcoal. I mean, you know, there's some of the, sometimes you find these metal straps, I guess, where they've had the trees strapped up, or I found nails, I found pieces of rock. I mean, I found all kinds of stuff in it. Have nothing you, ever, nothing ever really valuable. Yeah. Would be burn up. Yeah, it'd be burn up. Yeah. Have you ever gone to <coughs> one of those plants and seen? No, I've never charcoal? been to one. That would be pretty cool to go to one and take a tour of how, how charcoal's made. But you'd stink when you leave. Oh, yeah. I'd like to have that job, but that's a dirty job. Shoveling coal? Shoveling coal. <laughs> <laughs> Bagging coal. Surely they got a machine, right? Sure, I hope so. It started somewhere. You know, I think wasn't it Henry Ford that started like Kingsford Charcoal? It was a Ford that started Kingsford Charcoal. I don't know if it was Henry, but. I think you're a, right, yeah. yeah. Was, I guess it was in Michigan. Um, Someone from the community asked if you'd ever had an experience using Red Oak. Um, I've used it. It's just, uh, I mean, we just call it oak. I mean, oh, I there's I all see. different kinds of species, but I've cooked with oak. I'm sure it was either red oak or pin oak or white oak or something like that. It's a pretty common species of oak wood. They were saying they don't have access to post oak, so they were wondering yeah, if they could use it. you could red use oak. it. You could use it. And honestly, I don't know if I could tell the difference between post oak and oak if Oops. it was cooked. All right. Honestly, can you tell the difference? If you're using like a cherry wood, or cherry you can definitely apple. You, the the fruit woods I can definitely pick up. You on can pick up on because they have different. They give it different flavors, and different looks. Like you know, it's just a it's a different sweeter flavor. Uh, peach is one that's really you know if you cook with something with peach wood, you can pick it out. Apple's kind of mild, but it's a little sweet, so you can usually say, oh, that's that's probably got some fruit wood. But then cherry drives that pink color. You know, you get really good color from it, and it has its own unique sweetness too. Those are the three that I could probably really pick out. Now, the one, the predominant one that I can, that just about anybody should be able to tell you is something that's smoked with mesquite. You're going to know that's mesquite wood. It just has its own unique uh, bitterness. To I was going to say that. I don't know if I could pick out like, <laughs> yeah. is that cherry? Is that apple? Oak, that like say oak and hickory and even probably pecan. Those would be pretty hard to just think. I, it, you know, you could line up three different things, cook with three different most people probably wouldn't even be able to tell, and I doubt I probably would. But, but if it had the fruit wood, I think I if could it had mesquite, mesquite, I think I could find it every time. And then most of the fruit woods, I think I could tell you which one was which. Do you have a preference? Uh, man, I've always used pecan, hickory, and cherry. Those are my three, and I like to mix them. But, um, you know, I'm not scared to use some oak and, or apple, or if I'm going over to Georgia, I usually throw in a little peach. But the three, the cherry, the pecan, and the hickory here is a, it's a good wood combination. Do you make any changes if you're cooking over in Texas? Um, pecan, just the way I roll over there. You don't do Post mesquite. oak, some, but no, I never do mesquite. <laughs> do you not I like never mesquite? Do mesquite? I don't like mesquite. 
I don't like it. I know everybody says, I'll oh, do a mesquite smoked turkey breast or whatever. And I say, eh, go ahead. You did. I did. It's, I mean, it's okay, but it's not near as good as the other three I mentioned to me. That's just my, but that's my personal taste. If you grew up eating mesquite, that's probably when you think of it or taste it, that's what, man, that takes me back to being a kid. That's the way barbecue is supposed to taste. Well, it's because you grew up with it. So you like it. So it's just personal. Personal that's it. preference. That's it. So I got some questions for you. I don't even know if Texans really use mesquite. I, th- I think they they started telling the Yankees that were coming down there to use it. <laughs> they got plenty of wood for you. Use that mesquite wood. And it's just oh, yeah, that's what we use. Growing wild. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I use that. We'll use this oak and pecan we got. I mean, how many of those restaurants, you know, the famous ones over in Texas, do you think burn mesquite wood? Uh, Probably not many, if, if any. It's just something you don't do. So, um, got some questions from the community. All right. Jeff, he he recently picked up a New York strip slab from Costco. Talking a whole whole strip loin. Okay, so that's like a prime rib, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Stri- okay. It's like a ribeye loin, but it's the strip. It's back further, a little back further on the cow. So you've cooked that before? Yeah. Oh, they're great. They're fantastic. Cook them. I cook you them cook like prime them rib. whole. Yeah, you cook yeah. just like prime rib. So his, his question was. Can he cook it like a brisket? Mm, you can, but I, I wouldn't. It's going to dry out. I mean, it's going to be dry. It just is. I mean, it's it's not a it's not a good good cut of beef. I mean, why ruin it? You I mean, said that I, about doing a tri tip brisket style, and it I did say that, good. and it worked. Um, I just was it as good as like rare tri tri tip? No, 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 but no. it was pretty you good. Cook it like that. You can, and there, you can cook. You know, you can cook it like it. I just know from experience cooking a ribeye too long is not it just wasted a ribeye and the strip's gonna be leaner than the ribeye. Have you ever taken a ribeye up to like two oh two? Not on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> not on purpose. It, it just uh, it, it's not you're you're wasting the meat. Don't don't pay that much money if you're gonna cook something like that. You're much better off cooking a chuck roast like a brisket than slicing it or you know, something that's a cheaper, more less than you know, less expensive cut of beef. So you think Jeff should cook it like a prime rib? I would. I would. I'd cook it like a, just like a prime rib, and they're fantastic. They're phenomenal. They are good. We did that for Christmas one year. Instead yeah. of a prime oh, yeah. rib, we did a strip. Yep. Strip one. They're good. They're really good. And and it's cheaper than a ribeye, usually. Should be. Eric asks, is it worthwhile to inject a prime-grade brisket flat? For a competition, I would. Every time, all day long. Or cook it at home. I usually don't even inject my brisket. I don't. I don't think it needs it. I'm not trying to jazz up one bite. I'm trying to enjoy know, the a whole meal. thing. Yeah, yeah. Eat that whole flat. Well, what would you get if? I mean, what would be the purpose of injecting? Um, it just puts more flavor in it. Puts more moisture in it. So if you if you're going from that standpoint, if you just want to do it to make sure you you know to add some more moisture to it, just go with something simple like a little beef broth. A simple injection, but if you want to start, you know, if you're trying to get it to retain moisture and you're trying to get this super rich flavor and, you know, you're doing it more comp style, you could buy like a commercial uh, beef injection or something like that, you know, something out there to add it to it. A lot of times they have, you know, moisture uh, Phosphate. phosphates and stuff in them that's going to help them retain moisture and it changes, you know, somewhat changes the texture a little bit. Changes the flavor a little yep. bit too. Yep. I think it takes away from like the <clears throat> natural Beefiness oh, definitely, or definitely. natural porkiness, whatever mm-hmm. you're cooking. By injecting. Yeah. It's it's very rare that I inject anything I'm cooking just at home to eat. I just I don't I don't care for it. I want to taste the meat. I don't want to try to cover it up. I want to use my seasonings and the smoke and if I do put a sauce on it, put a sauce at the end, you know. But try to keep it more natural. Um I don't think I gain that much from, you know, the moisture level because usually a prime one's got enough fat in it. To where it's not going to dry out as, as much as a choice one would. So you shouldn't, you should really, the moisture is not really a problem there. Why do you inject for a contest? To get, because <laughs> the judge is only taking one bite of it often. And I want it packed full of every bit I can get in it. All the moisture, all the flavor, all the richness, all the texture. I want it all right in one bite. And, but that's not barbecue you sit there and make a meal off of. You're cooking it for that judge to take a, one bite of it. That's why we do it, and we do it because everybody else does. <laughs> <laughs> Fall in line, right? Don't get outside the box. Just do perfect inside the box. That's what competition cooking's about. Yeah, it is. Um, Jordan asks, um, 
So he's been cooking baby back ribs. Every time he cooks them, <clears throat> the lighter, more lean meat on the top is always drier and tougher than the darker meat in between the ribs. Yep. They're still okay. It's just not ideal. That's right. Because it's got that loin still attached to it. It all depends on how they trim that that slab of baby back or loin back ribs out. If they leave that part of it on top and the loin's a leaner meat, different muscle. And so it does. It, it kind of dries out some now. It gets a little barky. You can you can trim it off. A lot of times in contest, if it's too heavy, we'll trim it off. But a lot of times we use it to our advantage. And we call it the rib bacon because it makes long strips. And when you go up under it easy, you can take that off and show a judge, look, I, you know, I got bacon on top of my rib or whatever. It's not bacon at all. It's loin meat. But it makes a nice little bark on top. But it is a definite, you know, different texture. It's chewier. It's chewier, yeah. It's good, and I don't mind it on mine, but I don't want a big piece of loin on top of it. Um, so he's just asking, is this normal? Should it yeah, be it's softer? very normal. Um, I mean, you can cook it to where it's soft, too. Uh, it, it, it depends on how long, you, you know, when you put it in the wrap, how long you leave it in the wrap, what you got in that wrap, that makes it tender. Resting at the end softens it up some. Like if you're cooking those ribs and you're glazing them as soon as they come out of the wrap and you're serving them right after, that, of course, that meat's going to be a little tougher. But once it sits upside down, that loin meat down in that rib liquid that's in that full pack, and then you let it rest for, you know, an hour or two after they get done before you glaze them, that softens it up. So you can you can – do some things to make that texture soft. I feel like resting is your answer for almost everything. <clears throat> Why like is the that? The importance of resting because it is important. Not be it's under, very important. Yeah, we talked about that last week. Do you feel like that was a big epiphany for you and your when you realized in, in competition cooking? Definitely. I mean, even in better quality food at home. But I just think most of the time when we're cooking at home, we don't really we don't factor in a rest, so we don't think about it. It's like. I mean, I spent a long time cooking this. I know I'm probably going to feed. They got some folks ready to eat. And so they're, you know, it's it's ready. To, it's like, let's eat now. Let's eat now. Yeah. <laughs> let's don't let it rest. And so you don't oftentimes. But if you work that in from the beginning and you know, okay, it's going to take me an extra two hours, just whatever time it normally takes. But And you learn, you do that now. Oh, I try to now. Yeah. Um, I try to be way ahead. I'd rather be way ahead when I'm cooking something for people that I had pushing it right up to the minute. Now, if you're grilling something, that's different. I don't but like it's my usually steak rest. Not too long. You, it you like it right off the grill, so you want your steak as hot as you can get it. I mean, There's different thoughts on that, you know, different trains of thoughts. Like some people said, oh, you need to give it seven to ten minutes before you cut into it to let those juices, and some people say that makes absolutely no difference. You cook it, you eat it as soon as it comes off the heat. So I guess it's up to you. I don't. I really don't mind, like, I mean, if I cook me a ribeye and I take it to my plate and I go sit down and I start cutting it, yeah, some juice might run out in my plate, but that's what I'm sopping back up when I'm yeah. eating it, you know. I'm running my meat through it, yeah, my right. potatoes getting yeah, some of it. Yeah, everything's getting some of that, so I don't <laughs> mind it. It's not as important to me as resting a brisket or resting some ribs or a pork butt, for that matter. Anything big? Yeah, anything big. All right, one more for you before I let you go. All right. Kirk asks, he's thinking about a pellet smoker. He's narrowed it down. He's interested in a rec tech or pit boss. I've never cooked on either one, actually. But if I had to pick, <laughs> it would it would depend on which one I could get for the same price point that was bigger. What was the I would, but that's what that's The brand wouldn't decide me on those two. It's bang for buck, size for the money. You want capacity, two. as I think they're they're about equal. I mean, you know, you've got all you've got a bunch of different grills at that level. That's so. What's going to come down to is price point. If they're the exact same price point for the exact same size grill, um, I might go rec tech. Yeah, I, I might go pit boss tomorrow. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't cooked on either one of them, so my but dad's I, got a rec tech, and it's like a cooking machine. I've cooked on it yeah. twice, and both times, I mean, no problems. Meat tasted amazing. Uh, huge hopper on the back. Like, yeah, this is, I don't know what the exact model is. It has like bull horns for a uh, handle handles. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it has like a 40 pound hopper in the back or something like that. It's, it's ridiculous. Do you like yeah. it better than your Traeger? <sighs> I don't think cooked on it enough to say that. Say but. that. No. I know my parents, uh, Waylon actually won a rec tag mm-hmm. down at, at the, the shed. shed and he gave it to my parents and my dad cooks on it and he says it does have great, you know, He's got one of my he's got one of my old Yoders there, the old red one that I used to do videos with. 
and he's got that rec tech, and I think he fires up that rec tech more than he does the well the odor, just because it's easy. I mean, and it's newer. And it's newer, yeah. It's got more bells and whistles. I, I did imagine. give him a Traeger though, so we'll see what he uses when they <laughs> gets that Traeger put together. Um, that's all I got for you, Mount. It's uh, time to start that Easter vacation. It is. I, I know everybody's going to be cooking some good stuff for Easter, so y'all take some pictures and share it in that community, man. Let's see some of it. There might be uh, some crawfish cooking this weekend. Man, prices, prices shot back up. They had come down a little, but then they shot up really? like 40, 50 cents. I'm waiting on them after. I'm going to get to cooking crawfish after Easter. Hopefully the prices will start going down. Oh, let's do that the weekend after Easter. Got that we got something we got to do that weekend. You can cook crawfish. Oh, we've got a chair. Uh, we're we're doing that Hope Outdoors event. Um, taking some, but that's uh, on a Saturday. Yeah, you can cook crawfish on Friday. Hunt. Might do it. <laughs> That'd be good. Y'all cooked crawfish last week, and I didn't get I told, any of I it. Told you to. Uh, if y'all haven't seen, so we had we got a new buddy Trent Ellis. He's from Mississippi, and he does stuff on. He's doing stuff on YouTube, uh, TikTok, everything. But it's mainly short form co- uh, comedy content. But he did a long form video on YouTube of cooking craw, us showing him how to cook crawfish, and we were down at uh, camp doing it. It's pretty funny. But it's, it's, he's a, he's a funny guy. His content's pretty good. Yeah, he's genuine, and yes. he's just like that. Just like he is on his videos. That's how he is in person in real life. Because I hunt, you know, he hung out with us at the contest all day, and then I took him turkey hunting on Sunday, and he's he had me rolling. He had me rolling. It was, it was a lot of fun. He walked the dog out of me, too. Like, we chased turkeys all over the place. <laughs> you got your steps in I that day. got my steps in that day. But we had a blast. We didn't get a turkey. We got we did everything but get the turkey. So it was exciting. But um, He's on TikTok. Did you see the TikTok he did about couldn't <laughs> get it done? Yeah, oh, yeah, I did see that. The funny one was to me, though, he did one when he first got there. This jerker makes a TikTok in, like, 15 minutes. But he did one when he started out in the bathroom. <laughs> And then he, it's like a little tour of, you know, everything there. A little quick tour. Of, of your farm, yeah. yeah. It's Trent Ellis, T-R-E-N-T-E-L-L-I-S. Yeah, on TikTok. On, on just, I think that's what he goes by up on YouTube too, isn't it? I think so, If you so, search yeah. his name, you'll find it, but it's pretty funny. Y'all go check him out. Subscribe to him because he's, he's funny. And um, It's wholesome humor. And there's a crawfish recipe-ish. Yeah, yeah, kind of. It's not really a recipe at all. <laughs> It's more, it's more of how to do it wrong. No, the, the crawfish was fantastic. Like That was Mark's recipe, and it was, man, he makes this puree up. And that's the first time I've done it with the puree. And it's like a puree, like he takes like two stalk, two bundles of celery. What do you call it? The whole, I call the individual a rib. So it's the stalks. Like two stalks of celery, chops it up, sack of onions, bunch of garlic cloves, and blends all that in like a food like processor. Like a blender? Yeah, a blender. Yeah. And then turns it into like a paste. It looks nasty. And then he mixes chicken broth with it and just kind of to thin it out. So it's kind of like this liquidy. It doesn't look good. Yeah. It doesn't look good at all. But when you dump it in the pot, it flavors it. So instead of just cutting up onions and cutting up celery and putting it in there and cooking it down and they get all mushy, this stuff kind of disappears when you get it boiling. But you get all that flavor. And then along with the crawfish seasonings, seasonings and the lemons and the citrus juice and everything, the butter that we put in there, it just it makes a fantastic pot of crawfish. I think Mark lies, lays awake in bed at night just thinking like, so, what can you do different? Yeah, how can I improve my crawfish? Oh, this time we took, I don't know how many cloves of garlic it was, put them in a mason jar, punched holes in the lid. This is genius. Actually, yeah, yeah, and then throw it in the pot and then hold it down to where the juice goes through those holes and fills up. and The jar sinks and it cooks all that garlic in the pot in the jar so where you can pull it out and strain it and you got all this cooked garlic and you don't have to dig through and it doesn't just get mushy and dissolve it, it's it was really really good and i love garlic i, I love too. whole cloves of garlic in a crawfish bowl i'll throw whole cloves of garlic in my pot roast in the crock pot you know i'll do it when i mash the potatoes like boil some garlic cloves with the potatoes but yeah. We like garlic. That's yeah. right. So, Tyler, do we have anything? The community, the contest is over. We had some winners, right? Yeah, so we wrapped that up. We announced mm-hmm. the winners this morning or yesterday morning if you listen to this on Friday. Uh, so make sure you all go over and check that out. We're going to be having some more giveaways really, really soon. So make sure you all join the Let's Get to Cooking community over on Facebook.com forward slash group forward slash H2Q community. And it's Easter weekend, so like Malcolm was saying, share your Easter recipes. Let us see what you're cooking and I know I'm going to be, so. I want to see the deviled egg pics. Somebody <laughs> did, uh, somebody posted one. It was like 
There's one that I did recently too, uh, but there was shrimp on top of it. Yeah, um, yours hadn't come out yet. When's that come out? This week? Yeah. Okay. Today, I think, but. Oh, it would be out by the time this this goes live. <laughs> <laughs> but yours was a uh, Cajun yeah. deviled eggs. You know, I like putting deviled, uh, boiled eggs in the crawfish bowl, too. They're good. Eh, y'all like it. You don't like, you just like standard. Give you some sausage and corn and potato, and that's enough. I really don't even care much for the corn and potato. Just the sausage? What about the mushrooms? I want the mushrooms. I want the garlic. I want it all. I like the onions. I like the little pearl onions. You don't like pickles? I like pickles in oh, it. The pickles are gross in it. Oh, they're so good. They soak <laughs> up so much flavor. <laughs> well, if that's all I got for you today, Mal. Where can they find a shell? If you'd like to connect with Malcolm, it's How to BBQ Right on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and of course YouTube. If you'd like to connect with me, it's Miss Southern Shell on Instagram and TikTok. All right. Well, we hope everyone has a happy Easter out there. Um, happy Easter. You better go buy them hams if you ain't got them. It's time. We will see y'all next week. We gone.